And we are live. Oh, jolly good. Hello, folks. Happy Tuesday. Happy Tuesday, Once indeed. Once again. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So spring has sprung. You can see yeah. by the wardrobe. The sun has risen. I wonder where the boydies is. The, some say the wing is on the, the bird, boyd. but that's... Oh, uh, no. no. Some, say, some say the boyd the is on, is the, on wing. the wing. But that's absurd. The, the wing is on, on the boyd. boyd. That's okay, right. Okay, fine. No. Okay. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah. Don't we, give up your day job, Angie. No. no. All right. She's the writer in the family. God help us all. <laughs> So today we are absolutely honored by um, the presence of our guest who you will see scrolling across the bottom, uh, who is... Not scrolling across my bottom. No, he's indeed, indeed. Not yet, um, anyway. He is absolutely a genius um, polymath from code to music to everything. He is the early adopter, George Massenberg, and the crowd goes wild. Da -da -da! Hello, George. Come Hello, on George. down. Hi. How are you? George. Very pleased to be here. Thank you. I'm fine, and I hope you are too. Oh, yes, we're great. Thank you. Delighted to have you. And you it's you're delightful to be here. I'm looking forward to a vigorous conversation. Oh, jolly good. So where are you beamed in from with your anonymous background? Where are you coming to us from today? Well, let me let me back up a second, because I, I really have not been well served by being thought of as a genius, because I've, I've, I'm, I'm not. And I've met geniuses, and I know what um, to hope for. But the best thing that describes me is I'm, uh, as I try new things, I'm a dilettante, you know, <laughs> just trying to uh, pretend to be uh, interested, and um, eventually maybe picking up something here or there. But no, no genius here. Uh, well, let's see what recent. What have I done recently? What have I done recently? Well. Uh, always designing product. There's always something in the back of my mind in terms of uh, something to improve recording. And I was asked. I was asked by a class uh, uh, that I taught at Blackbird Academy, a brilliant bunch of kids, if there ever was one. Uh, looking across my credits, saying, "You know, okay, so you've designed all this." They might have said, "Crap, uh, you've designed all this crap," and. <laughs> Have you ever done anything useful? Meaning, have you ever done anything outside of audio? And um, no, I haven't, uh, kind of. I mean, the odd fix in the studio, but no, I'm pretty useless in any other, in any other field. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, we're working on a project at the moment, which is based on audio is, you know, the primary means of communication for the whole world. So I think without, without audio... You know, there's learning is more difficult. Uh, everything is more difficult without audio. And so, yeah, and yet it was, it, it was it's been pointed out that um, um, movies without uh, audio, uh, if they're good, there's still a picture. If it's a Sydney Pollock, if it's a good picture, it's still a good picture. Yeah, but um, yeah. you, you know, movies without video you know. it doesn't, yeah that doesn't work <laughs> so there's that yeah you have so to anyway. take, definitely have to take the lens cap off if you're filming a movie <laughs> if you can remember yeah the, the yeah. required setting so how on earth did this all begin for you was it the love of music first or mathematics and coding and audio or did it all just come about at once very much very much a love of music my mother was a, a player and um, a, a, a pianist. I mean, not a professional pianist, but a, a, a played. My whole family uh, seemed to be musical. My, my brother, unfortunately, played the clarinet, which I found terribly annoying and had <laughs> its an acquired taste, the clarinet. Um, but um, my mother would take us to the, uh, by the time we were old enough to, to go to the symphony orchestra. And so I was immersed not only in real live music, but also, you know, she had records. She had 78s uh, yeah. from, I mean, I remember listening to Bolero and having to change the 78 three times because it came on four sides. Oh, oh my and, God. Uh, oh, wow. And, uh, um, and then, shifted my attention as I also grew up in Macon, Georgia, um, to the radio and what was coming out of R&B in the late 50s and early 60s. 
and um, I, let's say 60s. I'm, I'm, I'm not that right. old, but uh, but just the uh, just the rawness and the story coming out of right that era in American music, and it was brilliant, it was unfettered energy. And may I not avoid the subject? It was raw sex, and yeah. to how old I was, eight, nine, ten, that was exactly the ticket. That, that worked. So, I mean, it was that and sorry. Yeah, I mean, it found found its way across, you know, across the world and specifically Liverpool, our hometown being a big shipping port. um, That is where, you know, the American ships would come in, the Merchant Navy, and they'd have these records on board with them and they'd trade them for, you know, English chocolate or cigarettes or a ticket to get in the club. And that was where Bob Wooler, the original uh, DJ at the Cavern Club, would go down there and, you know, hang out with the sailors, if you know what I mean, and bring <laughs> yes. the records back. And it was Bob who introduced all of that R&B stuff to John Lennon. And that's why the Beatles started playing that stuff at the Cavern, because it was just so sexy. It traveled the world. So we'll circle back to my Paul story a little later, because that falls out okay. of oh, that. Yes, I <laughs> Uh-huh. But but I would I, I, I would want to say that I was never because I played trombone and um wow. but was never terribly good at keyboards. Um but there was no real place for a trombone player in guitar music and uh well in, in certain kinds of ensembles, certain kinds of records, pop records of the sixties. They were they were no no uh competition for the uh, English records coming in. And, and I pretty much would track the quality of the record. It really got my attention if, if there was a little bit more depth, if I could hear more depth in a recording. So West Coast Recordings got ahead of New York Recordings, huh. just to generalize. And um, so I, I love the engineers making records in Los Angeles, Bones Howe and uh, oh, yeah. Lee Hertzberg and uh, all, the, all those guys that worked at uh, came through Gold Star and uh, the downtown studios wow. and would listen to the sound, and which blew me away as much as the music. Right. And there you go. Well, what was it they used so to say back, started, back, in those, back in those days? The, um, yeah. the ultimate um, definition of an optimist is a trombone player with a pager. <laughs> With a beeper. Um, <laughs> I've heard that as a banjo player as well. So, I mean, it's, it's a flexible. It's yeah, yeah. Flexible. Yeah. yeah. But, oh, but we I can't think tell you... jokes, can we? Gotta be, you know, we've got to be very careful not to tell jokes. So you'll stop me and hit the red button. Nah. <laughs> we, don't have, we don't have cancel culture viewers. We, we've got reasonable people who believe in music and love and common sense. So. <laughs> wow, that's yeah. weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, that's good. weird. Yeah. 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 So you you said about the 78s that your mum would play. Would they still be on the old Bakelite format or were they vinyl yet? They were Bakelite. They were Bakelite. And and of course, some of them were uh, were broken. But that was uh, that was and this is coming out of the 50s. So we didn't I mean, although we did have when we have the 45, the 45 was post the. or along with the LP, Columbia was one, RCA was the other. And um, and so we had those, but I didn't have a, a turntable and a system until I built it. And I, I've sort of, when I needed oh. something, I've always built it. So, what? That, Clever ass. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So did you know? Well, that's okay. I mean, piece, piece of tri- it's not piece that of trivia about, <laughs> Piece of trivia about Bakelite. They used to put a 5% breakage uh, in the recording contract between the record company and the artist because as they would deliver Bakelite, it would crack. And so the record yep. company would, would only pay on 95% of the, the records pressed or baked. That's where um, they came from. I didn't know that. Yep. And yeah. it's still to this that. day in the digital contract. If you have a regular big record label contract, look for that. They will still try to bake that into the, the discount they only pay on ninety five percent because that five percent breakage is still in there for MP threes. <laughs> okay, so have you interviewed Peter Asher yet? Not yet. No, he's traveling all over the place. I know Peter from many so years ago, but we 
Here's something brilliant that Peter did. Peter is as good a manager as he is a producer, as he is a musician, as he is a wit and a raconteur, what, whatever you could say. He's he's a. Oh, that's another line. Um, what <laughs> Peter Asher did when Lyndon renegotiated, renegotiated her contract is he looked at. Uh, manufacturing costs, as you know, we have to, uh, they have to, record company gets to recoup manufacturing costs. And merging with the uh, middle 80s, Peter foresaw this new technology. The CD, CD kind of appeared in 1980, 1981 for insiders. But, you know, Peter keeps his eye on technology. And um, he uh, looked at the contract and said, well, wait a second. Yes, yeah, CDs cost $3 now, but they're likely to come way down. We're not guaranteeing you uh, the uh, cost of a CD at 1981 prices because it was $3, and they would eventually quickly go down to under a dollar, and then even lower, and now nothing. Now their coasters are worthless. But um, he, re he negotiated something called the, the black vinyl floor, which is just based on the manufacture in, in quantity at scale of um, vinyl LPs and based Linda's contract on that. And uh, he kept coming with brilliant things like that, but you know, made Linda take notice. Um, yeah. and, and the idea that technology is continually changing and that the... Yeah. Powers that be are always going to try to take advantage of it, uh, whatever benefits them and disadvantages yeah. us. I'm I'm sure. Does it does it make you as sad as it makes me that this young gener younger generation think that MP3 quality is you know the the standard? What they're listening to on cheap plastic headphones is as good as it gets. Well, we have a way of of addressing that because as educators, we have to, in some way try to break through that. So if we can find, <laughs> that's very funny. Elizabeth, um, Peter. <laughs> if, we, if we can find a uh, one student in the room that yeah. when we demonstrate not only MP3 versus CDs, but high resolution versus um, CDs and very high resolution, uh, May I get geeky for a second and say yes, 320, 320, 24 uh, or M MQA, who are associates um, yep. in uh, Cambridge, sorted out. And he's trying, Bob Stewart's trying to uh, restructure MQA. Because here's something that sounds to me and to some of us, not all of us, but some of us, as close as we can get to analog in a digital context on a digital uh, pipe. It's called yeah. MQA. And um, boy, it has a very narrow audience, but I love it because the records that I remember doing in analog at an analog is high resolution. There's no high resolution and low resolution analog, except to go back to cylinders. But high resolution analog has been with us since Mother Masters when Edison went from cylinders to flat discs to copy Berliner's success. Um, he developed a mastering process, a mechanical mastering process that is stunning. And the uh, I, I work for the Library of Congress, and some years ago, um, we got uh, an offer of Edison's original Mother Masters, and he played them and found extraordinary fidelity and response off of these old mechanical processes. Any process improves over time. Because yeah. that's the way we are. We have to tinker and tinker and until we until we can sell it, and then we have to tinker some more. Uh, but I get I get off subject. Excuse me. No, 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 no. It's fascinating. It's fascinating yeah, stuff. Absolutely. And I just I just think that it's such a shame, you know, that music is it's worked on very very hard by lots and lots of people and talented people, and they're not for the most part making any money because of streamers and Spotify and things. But, you know, the, the massive audience that's consuming the music is, to me, consuming it and not necessarily enjoying it as we would sit in an old Chesterfield armchair with a pair of nice wooden speakers and play a vinyl record, you know. Oh, it's and like good play, play the whole record, play the yeah. whole record and turn it over and 
play the other side. And the reason that we're so distressed is that we don't have a choice. There used to be a choice between a vinyl record, because we saw record players, and CDs, which sounded horrible. And we had a choice. And the choice was um, often, but not invariably, often the vinyl record. So we don't have the high resolution stream. If we don't have the high resolution stream, the only thing that we can sell to stakeholders, record companies or what have you, is putting on the shelf a high resolution version of the music. Uh, think of a stereo mix done at high some high uh, some high digital standard or on analog. A lot of people print to tape, so that in the future we can redistribute it as a high resolution something, high resolution uh, stream or a high resolution something. And also the multi-channel. Uh, when we're successful at making the case, if we sell an immersive mix. It's right. not for the right. current consumption because there's no convenient uh, way to pull it in. But mm -hmm. for the future, something to go on the shelf because the on-the-shelf high-res product has shown itself time and time again to be variable, uh, uh, valuable. Right. Well, and that and product is pulled off the shelf. Yeah. Yeah. So now you just won. I'm going to do some Grammy dropping here. You just won your sixth Grammy in 2024, earlier this year, a couple of months ago, for exactly what you're talking about, the immersive audio mix. Can you tell people on a sort of, not a too geeky level, but what is immersive audio? How would you describe it to the, to the regular consumer? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is uh, what's long been my experience is as soon as you get a Grammy, you stop getting calls for work. Uh, because they assume that your price has gone up. And um, I want to tell everybody that I, that I have rock bottom prices available right now. Uh, operators are waiting. <laughs> operators are standing by. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. It was for the, I, the diary, Alicia Keys, right? It was for diary, which I actually didn't participate in as much as some of the others, but I did... Uh, stand behind my colleagues, uh, in particular, uh, Ann Mincelli, who is the uh, producer, who's who's brilliant and uh, will will be is yet to be heralded, but uh, she's brilliant. And uh, Eric Schilling, a mixer who I've worked with for many years, and Michael Romanowski, who's um, our mastering engineer. And, and what we had to do from the very, very beginning, from before Grammys or anything before we were a twinkle in anybody's ear or a twitch in anybody's, you know what? <laughs> um, we had to figure out what was wrong and figure out how to make it work. And there was a lot wrong when we started mixing. Everything was wrong and everybody was lying. Now this is the age of lies. So <laughs> it's uh, uh, understandable, but I mean, you know, you're not supposed to lie about technology, you know, cause we can measure it and, and prove you a liar if anybody would listen. And, but we had to figure it out. We had to make, we had to figure out what a good immersive mix actually uh, was and wasn't. And um, what wasn't was the thing that Dolby does, does with uh, spinning things around to show you that all the speakers you've just bought kind of work. But it's not music. It's not a record. And it's uh, improvable. And that's what we did. We would, we would decide that it had to be the hit. When you put on an immersive record, you had to hear the original hit because we're doing remixes. Right. If we were doing original work, it would still, it would have to rock. You know, yeah. enough with this spinning shit around. It would have right. to rock, and and having a record that had been a hit, remixing that meant that if it didn't rock, go home. Because yeah. that's not that's not going to get an audience. If they come to hear the artist, if they come to hear the music, they come to hear the record, we have to get that right, even though we make it larger yeah. and um, more, I want to use small, immersive, more engaging. It's certainly way more detailed. So for a great production, 
And a lot of the Alicia original work was great production because it's Alicia, Alicia producing in a high quality studio and hearing detail and adding subtle things. Right. There, I've used the S word. And MP3s strip out more subtle content. Right. Yeah. So we had uh, a platform, a carrier, a delivery system where people could hear, hey, there's strings in the chorus and they're beautiful. I want to listen to this again. Aha. That's where that's where immersives have, immersive playbacks have left a lot of people in the cold. Yeah, why, why should I hear this again? Okay, I know what it is. Shit's flying around. Yeah, great. Next. But actually something that's emotionally engaging and that you want to hear again. That's, that's, that's the magic. The goal. Yeah. The magic part. Wonderful. And as, as an educator now with the, um, how, how did the, how did the Met Music Engineering Technology Alliance come to fruition and come to be founded? And, you know, what, what is really your battle cry for educating the next generation of George Massenburgs? Two questions. Well, bloody hell, I don't know. Well, second question, definitely second. Um, first question is uh, where it came from is, I mean, let, let's be honest. We're geeks. You know, we speak a geeky language. If I slip into um, extreme geek talk, you know, you'll stop me, uh, I hope. But the, um, the the thing is, there are only so many people we can talk to and other engineers. Right. I mean, Peter Asher says terms engineers as, as, uh, as very much like hairdressers. You know, we're all, always bitching about somebody else's work and, and uh, about bad clients. And we're like bad hairdressers, not even good hairdressers. So, I mean, when we slip, slip into geek, it helps greatly to have a friend at our side that uh, that speaks geek. And wow, we have a great time and, and we eat together, we drink together and we talk geek together. And so at some point, or very early on, and I'm less mentioned than my comrades and I'm glad to take a back seat here. Uh, Phil Ramon, uh, kind of the grandfather of modern recording. Yeah. Or the... I don't know what, I have to come up with a better term than that. But he, um, you know, just started talking about, you know, we ought to get together. And so we started get, getting together and small groups of us, uh, Doug Sachs and I, Doug Sachs, who created Mastering, make no mistake, it came out of the Mastering uh, channel at Doug Sachs's place and eventually was made famous by his direct disc records. And they are real collectors at him now. But Doug Sachs would get together, and I would get together when his wife would be in art school learning how to paint every Tuesday night and then later every Thursday night for five or six years every week and invite somebody to come in and sit in. It, and, you know, it, it got to be a thing. Always ate at Musso Frank's, which I'm, I'm sure oh, yeah. you know. And... Yeah. Uh, Doug Sachs would always have the chopped salad and I would usually get the roast chicken and <laughs> so on and so forth. But, but we invited the, the best minds in the business and only had a few sort of negative experiences. A negative experience like um, somebody saying, I don't know what you old farts. And this was a long time ago. We were not old yet. I don't know what your old farts are trying to do, but this isn't working. But generally people remember this. But it's an extension of that. The, the more we talk and are able to say, you know, that especially to Elliot, well, to all of us, and say, you did that record? To so yeah. you did two? Well, they were great, you know. What's it like working with that producer? And then we tell producer stories and musician stories. And um, especially, especially with Elliot, because Elliot and I cross paths a lot. And yeah. Jimmy and I cross paths, yeah. That that's Elliot Shiner from, uh, the, I mean, just off the top of my head, Steely Dan and Acura fame, who is part of your Met Alliance, right? And I think of him as the original Van Morrison uh, recording engineer, right. because those yeah. records were very well done early on when other records weren't as well done. But yeah, and um, 
And so it's the guys in our group, and we're thinking of inviting friends in and talking to them and because we're fans of, I'm a huge fan of Bill Schnee's work. He's yes. just to watch him work. He dances on a console like I wanted to do and eventually learned how to move very quickly on an analog console before automation and before I improved automation. I did one of the systems. That's where George and I cross paths is that's so another story for later. Okay. Yeah. That's oh, then there are many stories there. So that was so, really yeah. kind of the genesis of the Met Music Engineering Technology Alliance, right? And I mean, past members have been none other than, well, you know, Ed Cherney. Al Cherney. Al Cherney. Al Cherney. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and, um, you're and Phil, Ramone. Phil Ramone was a founding member. Wow. And so, but your credo yeah. is really about educating um, not just kids, but people really who want to understand your industry, right? And it comes down to uh, a, a subject that's simple to state, a little harder to imagine and nearly impossible to teach. And that is critical, critical listening and critical analysis of recordings. Okay. Critical listening really understanding what it is when you can deconstruct a record or a music recording, let's say, and to understand in as much detail as listenings will give you. And, and you, you know, the, the, it happens time and time again, guys, when, when the Beatles came out with CDs and we heard parts on the CDs that we'd never heard on the records and then went back to the vinyl and heard parts on the vinyl that were nicer than things on the record, that's critical listening. What was yeah. What are people actually talking about when they say records are better? I don't think records are better. I'm a technologist uh, through and through. I think um, we're improving digital um, quite a bit. We've taken giant steps in improving converters, and we're just waiting to get rid of MP3. Right. Um, but you know, we can teach MP3. But when you teach critical listening, here here's a uh, a detour, and you'll stop me if it gets too geeky. But I listen uh, as a, a producing engineer. High resolution file types. Uh, we'll come back to that. Remind me of that. As an engineer, I'm listening from the head the heart and the guts. From the head is the perception of something wrong. Uh, there's a crackle, where's that crackle coming from? And given my experience with crackles, I can say that sounds like a loose pin on a mic cape. That sounds like a, more often, a bad guitar player. Uh From the head, <laughs> there's, the, there's a buzz, there's a buzz. And then you have to decide who to negotiate with your heart and your guts. Now your guts yeah. tell you, uh, this take started great. You stop and I will kill you. Um, so the head and the guts are now at odds because the head hears a buzz coming from the guitar and and the guts say, don't fuck around. And, <laughs> and the, heart, the heart is for a love song and the passion in a performance. And again, these three things, these are like three gnomes they're battling it out uh, while a take is going on. And I'm trying to make the right, trying to say the right thing. And invariably, it's to just shut up. But, but if something <laughs> is improvable, that's where a record producer is best served by learning how to do critical listening. And, and, not, and not just, hey, man, that's, that's rocking. Uh, but no. Yeah. Standing Absolutely. back and being being objective where you can be uh, something that's beautiful to your heart is a little harder. But if you can relax, if you can really relax, you mm -hmm. can peer into the right brain and deeper into the right brain. So wow. there, there's some advice. There's, everybody should just fucking relax. <laughs> exactly yeah. right. Well, and... <laughs> These are the kind of things that I'm guessing that you're in session live in two days immersive weekend in a studio with you guys. 
uh, bring to the that's, table, right? That's what we try to do, is what's right. important, what's important, and how you can, as a professional, best help a musician, artist, singer, whatever, achieve their what's in their mind's ear of where they're trying to go with this song or production or whatever, and really just trying to make this process transparent, make right. this recording process easy for the artist. And, and so we won't find us, and I, th I think we're all the same in this respect. We don't, we don't confront artists with, you know, you're fucking singing out of tune. What are you going to do about that? Because this yeah. is painful. Right. right. <laughs> yes. we, we, that's, not, that's not what we do. Generally, well, you uh, they're based. Yep. You got, you guys Sorry, kind of. I was going to say, there, I'm, yeah. I'm going to very quickly do this and then you shut me up, I hope. Uh, we can we can help a singer's pitch along with changing the headphones, giving them something better to listen for, change the way we might uh, uh, level correct audio going into a singer's headphones to help their pitch. So we're less likely to say, that sucks then here's what I hear. What do you hear? So right. I mean, it's teaching. Yeah. yeah that's, that it, well, it's that, that the S word again, you have to be subtle. I mean, you want to be, you know, you're, you're the, the boatswain in the, in the rowing boat, you're yelling, well, put, you know, you're, you're the leader of the pack, you're at the board, but you also have to be a fly on the wall and you have to be the doctor with the bedside manner. Right. And you have to listen to everything. Thing so in between takes you'll walk out in the studio and just kind of take it easy maybe maybe say oh man take it easy and uh, and you hear somebody say you know can you hear enough can you hear enough of the electric piano on the phones I don't know and they won't come forward with it unless you turn around and say wait a second did I overhear you to say so, and listening at that level where you're listening in general you're listening to the grass grow. You're listening to the subtlest right. voices in the room. Uh, the right. voices that uh, are most often marginalized in the room. You know, right. not the leader of the band. Uh, I don't want to go too far into that. But Wow. Sorry. I, 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 can I, before we go any further, can I ask you to tell us your Paul and George Martin story? Here go it on. is. Go on. Here, here it is. It's very short. Um, because I had I had uh, met George Martin um, years earlier before this thing uh, happened, and it had to do with uh, you remember the old Air Air Studios in Oxford Circus, the original studio yeah. on Oxford Circus, and and George yeah. had bought a new automation system for his Neve console in the second room, uh -huh. the mix room. And it didn't work. It was Neve, and of course, Neve was still riding high on the successes of their consoles. They were trying to build an automation system, and 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 uh, tripping over their feet and shooting themselves in the foot uh, every time they tried to do an automation system. But they did deliver something that was imaginative and almost workable, called Nikem One. And didn't work very well. So they had NECAM 2, and it still didn't work very well. So, <laughs> so then uh, George bought a console. They said, well, we'll give you an automation system. I really think we've got it. And it was really trash. I mean, very bad. But by that time, I had invented third-generation automation and had put it in a lot of studios. And it was very expensive. And we had phone calls in the middle of the night because we were selling it all over the world and didn't sleep for three years. But uh, we got an automation system that defined the future of hard disk automation. That's wow. third generation hard disk automation. And the operator interface, how, how should we very simply turn functions on and off? So everybody's copied that. The other thing is when you... You know, you grab a fader on a board, you grab a fader, and a light lights up saying, well, you touched me. Well, that original touch control, I had to invent from scratch. For every invention out there, I have 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 that uh, go in the trash. For somebody stealing it, they just steal it. 
Yeah. Um, and so any number of these little things, the touch sense, um, and the way I built it was cheap and reliable, much more reliable than Neve. Little things like that, the idea of how we drove the fader up and down. It was just imagination. I'm way off subject. George um, bought one of my systems. And so okay. I went over and had a great end time, went to his club, White's, and had a had a grand time just talking to him. Got to be friends. And later on, um, we would go to Montserrat uh, with Earth, Wind, and Fire recording Montserrat. But in between, just you don't, remember- don't throw, that, don't throw that away. We would just go with Earth, Wind, and Fire that you worked on. <laughs> but wait a second, because this is a better story, because it's a story of uh, failure, and failure is my favorite subject. So in the, George and Paul had this idea to re-record Beatles tunes and it was the Bee Gees and Peter Frampton and it was the whole RSO time where yeah, Rob, Robert so. Stigwood, right? Was probably part of that it, whole thing. It was RSO. It was Stigwood's idea. It was between Stigwood and George Martin getting together and saying, why don't we recreate the Beatles tunes with these artists? So he came to us, Earth, Wind & Fire, and he had selected all the tunes to go to various uh, groups of producers. And uh, everybody did faithful renditions of the Beatles tune, wow. tunes um, up to that point. And I forget what it was, what the record was called, but it sold two, it sold a million somehow, but returned platinum. Uh, it was so bad. What we did, what we chose to do was just to reinvent the song. And that's how we did Got to Get You Into My Life, is right. it's a shuffle. Yeah, but it's yeah. way different than Paul's version. So, sure. you know, we did it. I, I did the session in Boulder, Colorado. Earth, Earth, Earth came out. I had everything ready for you. Cut the tune, and they went away. And I finished it. It was in the movie, whatever that movie was called. It was just a horrible movie and yeah. um, not worth resurrecting ever on late night TV. And, um, and I finished it and uh, took it to Cherokee where um, George, and, and this is 77 or something, where George and Jeff were slaving away, trying to make something of this thing and played it to them, put it on and played it to them. Uh -huh. And George said, you better, uh, won't you please play that again? And played it a second time. I said, you know, I'll just need to hear that one more time. And it went on several more times. And uh -huh. he was at, at that in that moment confronted with the fact that he had made the wrong record. And, oh. and you know, he's, he's a pro and didn't show it, but ours was a huge hit. And oh, theirs right. was a right. was huge, a flop. It returned oh, wow. platinum. They shipped back more records than they had sold. I don't know wow. how they worked that, figured it out. Anyway, I right. met George and we got to be friends. And, um, that later we would do Earth, Wind, and Fire and Montserrat. And, and he uh, came down for when we got there and, and we had a, had a grand time. And he let me use their, his little Honda runabout uh, ski boat. And uh, Jeff Martin and I would go out on the uh, lee side of the, uh, of the island of Montserrat and ski in the mornings. Wow. It was just great and great native food. Couldn't say Jeff, enough nice things. Jeff was an absolute sweetheart. We were talking he about was. him with Frank. And just when you think about it, when Jeff started his job at Abbey Road EMI Studios, they were the engineers had to wear little white coats, uniforms with little buttons. They did. They did. And the technicians uh, wore, wore blue smocks. But at any rate, just to uh, not leave you hanging, that the upshot of that is when we later talked about it, George said, you know, I took the tapes back and Paul wanted to hear them. And Paul sat in Air Oxford Street for a whole day and listened to Maurice White's vocal over and over and over and over again until he could copy it. Wow. And if you see Paul and, live now. <laughs> and, and he is he's a, a master of finding a story and phrasing it. He's He's one one of few masters left. 
Jimmy Webb being another one and Paul Simon being another one. And yeah. I don't know who else, yeah. but at any rate, that's, that's my Paul story. That's absolutely wild. And so these, these kind of story, when you just throw away names like earth, wind and fire, and I'm like, Oh wait, I'll pick, uh, I'll pick that up for you. Um, but you know, you drop these names because they're your work colleagues. They're your compatriots. Yeah. They're you're part of a team. I think for anybody who's watching who hasn't been in a, a recording studio, environment and that's and that's your day job and that's how you pay your mortgage and your medical insurance and your kids school um it's a dead serious job but but you guys the producers and engineers you have to make it fun otherwise the artists can't deliver the pressure is, is kind it of has to, it has to be fun it has to be yeah. fun jimmy bought this uh, uh did, did me, uh, just some years ago but did a whole string of records at uh, my studio when i went to studio in west l.a and uh you have to get to be friends with Jimmy because he's always brought the right foods. He's always got a hot dog machine and a popcorn machine. And uh, he used to be a heavy drinker. And Jimmy at some point said to his producer and to his band, who he was very loyal to, uh, guys, listen, we've got to do this. I don't know, Brendan McKinley, maybe you do. Hi, Brendan. Guys, we've got to do this differently. From now on, we're going to have fun like we do on the road. We're going to have fun in the studio. And I just, I, let, let me put a, a topper on it. If I am not having fun, I'm leaving. And you can finish the record and put it out under somebody else's name. But I'm leaving <laughs> if it's not fun. And so everybody had to take responsibility for having fun? keeping the eye on fun. That is just, that's absolutely wild. So, these are the kind of stories that you guys, you seven of you tell on your storytellers shows, correct? You've just done one in Ridgefield, Connecticut, and I was lucky enough to see the, uh, the video. But tell us a, a little bit about how storytellers came about and, uh, you know, what, what you're doing with that. Come um, up. A, uh, a local uh, friend of Elliot Shiner's uh, suggested you know, Elliot was telling stories because we always tell stories when we're not being actively monitored. Uh, said, you know, you really ought to, you know, think about telling. I bet your friends have stories too. Think about telling your stories to an, an audience. You know, I bet this would be appealing. And that was uh, Jared at uh, Richfield Playhouse. And Elliot um, mentioned the idea to me. And to the others, and uh, I, anybody will tell you I loved it right away and said, uh, I want to do it, but I want to produce it. Um, Chuck uh, was a little harder to bring along. Frank was sitting on the fence, but uh, Elliot and I had to talk to the rest of the guys into the fact that we could pull this off. We're, we're that arrogant and that stupid that um, – and we, funny, we could pull it off, and that and that we could balance the budget. We could make money doing it. So, mm -hmm. Elliot and I started piecing it together. And as people started complaining about not having this or that, it was already on our things to do. The script is a big thing. You do a live show, you got to have it's got to be scripted. So the stories really needed to be told. And Elliot and I would get on the phone, and later Chuck, and later. Chuck and Jimmy and Ellie and I would get on a Zoom with the team and say, tell us some stories. So I've got a spreadsheet with all these stories from Sylvia and from Chuck and from Jimmy and, uh, and from Frank. And I put my stories in there. And each of us had a bunch of stories, Nico, a bunch of stories, and looked at them and started thinking about how these stories could segue uh, think about dancing, segue into Chuck Ainley talking about dancing. Uh, but also mixing them up so we're not only going for the yucks, we're going for a balance. So Frank was very important to that. Right. Um, because he told a story that was as real and as, as visceral. It gives, give me, yeah. gave me the chills. Mm -hmm. And it breaks up the flow of, of just funny. So right. we had to, we had to put the show together in script form without knowing that if that it would ever work. Yeah. But the key was it was so much fun just getting together and telling each other stories that we just had to keep doing it. Right. And uh, 
And then I had to sell everybody on doing a high quality video. And I got an amazing price on it. And I was still had to fight for it. So at that point, <laughs> Elliot and I, at any stopping point, Elliot and I would say, and later Chuck would say, look, if there's any problem, we'll underwrite it. We'll pay for it. Oh. If there's any problem with video, I'll pay for it out of my pocket because I know this is going to be valuable. So that was the compelling argument to some of my colleagues said, oh, I don't know. That's a lot of money. It wasn't. It was four grand for a couple of red cameras and a couple wow. of black magic. Wow, that is a good deal. High quality video. I've been yeah. doing video for 13 years. The guys, um, yeah. Yeah. They, they, they don't get it. How could you know anything? I've been producing and directing operas and symphonies and small ensembles and special projects for 13 years in Montreal. And the time would have, would have been wasted completely had I not learned a lot about video and a lot about direction and a lot about opera. Right. Well, I, I mean, I, I would go see the storytellers anytime. I know the, the audience, you guys haven't, haven't seen it yet, but I think the story you're referring to Frank talked about on T flicks here was he was in Botswana recording the African people tribals thing. And, one of the choruses was Apollo, Apollo, Apollo. And he was, he was thinking it was the Greek God and the connection between these people who are literally living in the bush, who had been either seen or told about or handed down through generations, Apollo 11 in the summer of 1969 streaked across the sky, which is how they navigate. And they are still singing in 2020, uh, a story about something that happened one night in 1969. If that's not the power of music and longevity and preserving language, I don't know what is. It's, I, I, I think you're right. And I think that that, that hidden culture or that marg uh, marginalized cultures uh, is, is our, that's our ticket to engaging yeah. the rest of the world. Because, and let, let me add something else. You know, the thing about production is after you think you've got a song. Mm -hmm. But finding a song is a whole nother set of skills and identifying that song. And I've learned from the best, some clues to identifying a song. And one thing, two, well, two things are key. One is uh, uh, a cultural relevance. And the other is authenticity. And yeah. um, whatever authenticity means to you, maybe it's just an authentic cowbell. They say, oh, I know that Anyway. But it's happen. authenticity. <laughs> and more more authenticity, the better. Well, nothing is more fake than some of the pop records that we worship. And yet at the same time, they can coexist and they can coexist because we have this other wealth of records for the last 130 years. But 130 years we've been making music recordings. I know because we get to hear them. At Library yes. of Congress, um, and boy, some of them are just great. They're worth going back and revisiting. Right. Um, and and, and but that idea that it's important beyond the um, the immediate gratification of of the modern generation of TikTok. TikTok users. Oh. TikTok users, I have great respect for. I need you. We all need you. But listen, guys, that's <laughs> not music. That's that's clever, and we like it. That's the Sunday comics, and I watch I watch them and love some of them. But music takes it will take you somewhere else if you allow it to do so. Well, you Absolutely. know, I, I I look at some of these people making music now um, on you know, apps on their phones versus people like you and the Meta Alliance members who make real music. It, to me, it's the difference between, you know, microwaving a frozen pasta or learning, going to Cordon Bleu and learning to be a master chef. It's, it's all edible, but really? <laughs> so I teach, generally I teach at the graduate level. So I teach, uh, practitioners that have already been through undergraduate something. And we always require they have an instrument and some technical background at McGill and the Schulich School of Music. Other schools, not so much. Berkeley, you can be uh, pretty 
much a novice when you come in, they'll teach you something. But at McGill, we had to um, take these guys and, and try to teach them how to pay attention. And boy, it's it got rougher and rougher up until three years ago when I contemplated leaving. It, it's almost impenetrable. And you have to really set some boundaries to this thing that you need out of teaching. Yes, they're paying a big tuition, but here's what I need. And uh, to try to find that path, because you're going to find one or two in this group of 20 that's already there. They know what it is. They can listen. You put them in front of a council. They say they're there would remind one of uh, a Picasso in the raw. You know, they you know, here. Well, here's a mix. What do you want? Say, OK, well, that's OK. But what if it were at a church? And, oh, you mean tut, 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 there. What do you want? It reminds me of Picasso changing the nun to the squirrel with two deft strokes. Uh -huh. and, and that idea of really paying attention is wow. teachable if you can get people to picture sound. Get them wow. to get kids to picture sound. Close your eyes and yeah. picture the sound. Where is where is that instrument in relation to other instruments? Close your eyes. Barry Gordy at Motown is walk into a control room if he saw people staring at the meters and mixing. He'd go over the meters and tape over them. You're not allowed to work here unless you don't look at the meters. That's wow. Motown. Wow. So, I mean, well, sure. It's yeah, it's it's vibrant, it's real, it's it's 3D, it's 4D, it's 5D, right? It's it's every sensor. It's as many D as you will allow it in your brain. And being uptight about pitch and I got to get home to my wife and the rents do, all of that stuff takes away from immersing yourself in the musical experience. Right. Mark Lindsay, who was asking, our friend from Houston, who was asking the question before about what are the current uh, high-res file types, he's saying... Um, he listened to music through a DAC streaming from Tidal using a tube amp and found things that he'd never been, never heard before when listening to the same music for years. Well, I would recommend if you can get a hold of an MQA, an MQA, which stands for Master Quality Assured, an MQA decoder, DA converter, and sign on to Tidal. There's some uh, MQA encoded assets on Tidal, T-I-D-E-L, uh, yeah. that you could listen to today if you can find an MQA, a D-Day in an MQA decoder. Uh, so that's our high res stream of choice. Because Bob Stewart and his partner, Bob and Peter, developed this uh, technology to the right word is not compress, but recharacterize a very high resolution stream. Think of an analog source and you've you've uh, ingested it to A to D uh, mm -hmm. at a very high rate. You know, I can turn that off. I got to turn that off. Hang on. Right back. Okay. Um, what a, what a mind. Okay, so Incredible. MQA process is a way to recharacterize high resolution digital streams and to send them out as 4824. So what you're listening to in title is 48, 24 bit, 48K, which everybody can do now. And to hear original, very close to, you can afford it. The decoder is, I'll, I'll look it up while we talk. You can afford it. Question <laughs> is, where can you find it? Um, to recharacterize this music and you sit back and listen to this stuff and you're saying, I don't want it to stop, not rip these headphones off. That sounds like, well, the expression that I used to use, that sounds like moose cock. Uh, it's just <laughs> the worst thing you could possibly imagine. And, and you generally, why would you want to keep listening? But when, when you're listening to analog and high resolution stuff, you're listening from another point of perspective. Yeah, amazing. Well, we, we will have to have you back for a, a geek special show, and I'll have to do a lot more research on my uh, 
on my the banality of my questions, but this is I'm getting <laughs> so too. many well, so I many comments. Know. Actually, I, and I'm sorry that I'm I'm only running on, and, uh, no, and no, I just no. Can't no. This, but, fascinating stuff. Everybody but I wouldn't I, actually I wouldn't mind at all an all geek show. We could do an all geek program where every phrase has to have some impenetrable language in it. The all <laughs> geek, the show by geeks for geeks. I'm all thinking. right. Well, let's start the the Met Alliance version of Tflix. You guys could do one of these every month. I can Met help you get that Flix, set up. That's yeah. super easy. So, and as you guys, it's been so nice talking to you. I, I, I hope you have a brilliant Easter. We're looking forward to the weekend and, and the very best year. Let's look forward to doing it again. Absolutely. But before we go, everybody, head over to metalliance.com and uh, see what they're doing in session. And uh, there'll be new storytellers announcements coming soon. There is also a fabulous book for those drummers amongst you that is an absolute must have. This oh, is yeah. called Recording and Mixing Drums, Contrasting Techniques from Seven Lifetimes of Recording Experience. That is uh, also available on the metalliance.com. Um, and as George probably doesn't know, but as our regular viewers know, that we have for our very special guests, we always write a limerick and um, trying to find things to rhyme with George and or Massenburg, Massenburg. were a little no. bit difficult. <laughs> However, um, we pulled it all together and here we go. Yeah, Paul Moody is our, is our big uh, limerick fan. Lim he always limerick waits to the end for the limerick. Okay. So, a right. one, two, two three. three. Today we've, we've learned, learned much from, from our George. George. Our, our musical, musical tastes he did, he did forge. From parametric EQ and six Grammys accrued, he produced, well, let's, let's face it, a fuck ton of records. Doesn't rhyme, doesn't matter. Thank you, George. Uh, no, no, like I've that. never heard I've never heard accrued being rhymed. So well done. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's plenty more where that came from. It's so great to have you. Yeah. And uh, yeah, let's let's, let's put our heads together, together and do do an all geek show. Why not? Brilliant. Brilliant. And thank you, Paul. Well done. Absolutely. <laughs> Cheers, guys. Have a great right. Easter. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. See you soon. Cheers.